And living in grace and victory is found under God's hand, which seems counterintuitive, but the Bible is very clear. And we're encouraged as we look at this because God doesn't leave us guessing. God doesn't try to say, okay, here you go, you figure out how to live. God lets us know. God shows us how. And I'm so grateful for that, aren't you? So many things in this world we've got to try to figure out for ourselves. But in the Christian life, God gives us his grace and he leads us in his ways. And he shows us how we may live a life just full of the grace of God. I wish I had learned this a long time ago, and I've been a Christian a long time. But God shows us how we may live in victory, in grace, the enemy defeated in our lives. It's not always easy. In fact, often it's quite difficult. Nevertheless, he gives us a clear path, and that's what we've been looking at. We've looked at 1 Peter 5.5 5 and James 4.6. Both of these writers quote from the Old Testament, from Proverbs, and what do they say? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. humble. Okay, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time going over old ground again, but we've talked about how this, the spirit of pride is the spirit of the enemy. Pride is what made him say, I can be like God in heaven, and, and sent him, kick, caused him to leave heaven. Pride was the first sin in the Garden of Eden when the one who was proud then tempted God's creation, Adam and Eve, and said, oh, you can be like God. Ooh, I can be like God. And they ate the fruit. And it is still, the devil is not very creative, as we have found, right? He kind of does the same thing over and over again. But God speaks to his people and says, victory lies in humbling yourself. And so that's what we've been looking at. So where do we want to be? We want to be under God's hand. Because under God's hand, it's a hand of protection. It can be a hand of discipline, but it's always in love, as we're going to talk about a little bit more today. Last week, when we ended this part, when we were coming near the conclusion, we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I told you then, a good reminder, check your phones. Um, I'm sorry, pause just a minute, let me check my phone, because it, uh, Pastor Renee might send a message and say, I'm on the way. I am so sorry. My phone is... Upstairs, I'm okay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Remember when we used to fuss at you about check your phone, check your phone, and then one Sunday, service Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, noon, my phone rang two times in a row. My phone, my phone. See, God knows how to humble us when we don't humble ourselves. So we looked at Deuteronomy last week, and we looked at Deuteronomy 8, and I said if you want to read Deuteronomy 8, it's one of the key passages of the Old Testament certainly of the first five books of the Bible. Moses, in his farewell address to the children of Israel, is reminding them this is what has happened and this is what is ahead. He's going to pass the baton of leadership to Joshua. Um, we don't know how much he knows, but probably he knows some details uh, because Deuteronomy is 34 chapters long. He speaks for 33 chapters as it's recorded. Chapter 34, he goes up the mountain and, he, and God shows him the land of promise that he will not go into and then he dies. That's it. Chapter 34 of Deuteronomy. But those 33 chapters, he talks about the hand of God. We saw this last week, so let's look at this again just as a reminder. Three places in Deuteronomy 8. That's why I said this is one of the key passages of the Old Testament because it talks about how God dealt with the children of Israel but the principle that we read in Deuteronomy 8 is the same principle still how God deals with you and with me. Same, same principle. Sometimes externals change. And so Moses tells them, if they didn't know before, when God was leading you through that wilderness, he did it to humble you. He did it to humble you. He was doing something at that time. I don't know about you, but I know for me, when I go through the wilderness, I, I, I don't usually say, God, what are you doing? Usually I'm thinking, the devil, why are you bothering me? Why are you doing this to me? But as, as we said in the first service and as a reminder for each one of us, God is a wonderful multitasker. 
Do you think you're a multitasker? Those of us who are getting older, sorry to say, we have discovered that we're not really the multitaskers we think we are. We can maybe do one job well at a time. God can do so many things well at one time. And so we get into situations and we think, well, is this what is happening? God is doing this or God is doing that. And God so often is working on a lot of levels at the same time. And sometimes we think, uh, sometimes we'll think uh, the enemy is, is doing something, and the enemy may be trying to do something, but God, because he's God, and how great is our God, God is doing something as well. And so Moses tells them he was humbling you, so he has a purpose in those 40 years. And then we look at Deuteronomy 8, 2. Let's look at the whole verse again. We looked at this last time, but here's a reminder again. He led them on the entire journey so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart. And the next step, so he humbled, why? To test you, why? To know what was in your heart, why? To what end, whether or not you would obey him. So you've got these steps all the way. So, so clear for us, brothers and sisters. God is God, he knows what's in our hearts. But how many times have you and I gotten in a situation where something was done to us, or we were rubbed the wrong way, or somebody said something, or, or you name it, I mean, just fill in the blank, and something rose up in us and maybe came out of us that was so ugly, we shocked ourselves. Have you ever done that? Has that ever happened? Yes or no? Every one of us would have to say yes. All of us. I, and I've given you this example before, but one of the things I've been, a lot of times when I'm driving, when I'm on the road, that's my prayer time or I'm listening to the word or something like that. And honestly, I can truly just be praising the, oh Lord, you're so wonderful. And then maybe somebody cuts me off. <laughs> that idiot. <laughs> I'm being honest with you this morning because that is what's inside. And I would have been just, oh, praising the Lord. And James talks about that, right? He says, with the same mouth, we bless and then we curse <laughs> as well. And we laugh about that. But James says, in fact, it's really, it's no laughing, it's no laughing matter. It's not. Because what's inside, God knows what's in our hearts. Is there good in our hearts? Yes, there's, there's good. We love God. We're going after him. But the Bible also says that our hearts are deceptive, aren't they? That, 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 that there, there's wickedness, and so often we don't even know. God knows what's there. We don't. We don't. And so God does what? He humbles us. The humbling comes in the pressure. Why? To test. Why? So that what is there has the opportunity to come out in choice. Choice shows what's in my heart. Choice, what you choose, shows what is in your heart. What do you choose to do? And God says to us, are you going to obey me or not obey me? Does that make sense as we look at the progression? It, it's, it, in a way, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. It's, it's very simple. Are you going to obey me? And as we have said, it is not so much, well, are you going to punch somebody? Honestly, these days, as we get older or whatever, punching somebody is not really the struggle so much, is it? I don't know. Some of you may say, yeah, <laughs> I want to punch somebody. That's not usually the struggle. How many of you know, for most of us, as we've walked with the Lord, the struggle to obey deals with the inside parts, my heart, my attitude, the feeling I hold on to, the grudge I'm going to hold or I'm going to let go, the forgiveness that I'm going to give or I'm going to withhold. Am I going to obey? And the Lord humbles us so that there is the opportunity for what is in our hearts. It's there. It's there. And it's going to come out in choice. Why does God do that? God, can't you, do an e can't you choose something easier do you, can't, you, can't you make it not so hard and not so painful and not so unpleasant? No. Because until you and I know what's in our hearts 
as it comes out, it can't be dealt with. It can't be dealt with. As long as I think I'm okay, God can't touch me. God can't help me. God can't change me. But it's when it comes out. It's when it shows itself, when it rears its ugly head. And then I look at myself and I say, Oh, God! And I come to the end of myself when I realized, God, I thought I was better than that. Have, have you ever thought that? God, I thought I was further along than that. Lord, I thought I was more Christ-like than that. And I'm not. And that's when I'm humbled. And that's when we're humbled. And that's when God then steps in, if we will let Him, and He gives us His grace to deal with that thing in our lives that can be dealt with in no other way. Does that make sense to us this morning? That's how God works. That's how God works. And so he dealt with them and he deals with us in the same way. How did he do it? Look at, uh, look at, chapter, uh, look at verse 3. The next one, we talked about this last time. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. If God stopped there, he would be a hard God and a cruel God, and I don't want to follow that kind of God. But he never stops there, does he? You and I, very often in our relationship with God, in the way that we think, we go through hard times, and instead of seeing what else God is trying to do, all that you and I see is the hard time, the pressure, the humbling, the hunger, if you will. And if we're not careful, we just think, God, you're mean. God, you're hard. God, why? But we've got to come to the place where we see that God lets us go hungry and then does what? Go back to the children of Israel. What did he do? He gave you manna to eat. So he brings us. Let me, let me make the application. And we talked about this last time. They were in the wilderness. Pharaoh, as powerful as he was, could not give them manna. They were, they farmed, they had, there were crops, if they'd been back in Egypt, there were things that they could do to provide food for themselves. But they were now in the wilderness, and they were traveling. They could not plant. There was no way they could grow manna. I mean, they couldn't grow anything. They certainly couldn't grow manna because it came from heaven, and it came from God. They didn't even know what it was. It was the resource that came out of nowhere. That's how God does it. It's the resource that comes from God. But what happens, so... There they are in the wilderness. Did they have some food with them? Yes! They took food out of Egypt, didn't they? They took food, some food with them out of Egypt. But you've got a million plus people and all the cattle and, and all the sheep and everything else that's going along as well. And pretty soon they run out of resources and they come to the end of themselves. And it is when they reach the end of themselves, when they're hungry, that they are humbled. And then when they are humbled, at the end of their resources, God meets their need. Now, brothers and sisters, we need to see that picture and learn a lesson this morning in how God deals with us when he brings us. I, I, I want us to get it this morning. Whatever situation we are in, it may be with people. It may be with a job or lack of a job. It may be in a relationship that is just so, so hard for you. It may be in finances. It can be in any number of areas. And you've done everything you can do. You've tried as hard as you can try. You have done everything you know to do. You've followed all the steps. You've all of that. It may be even in the area of you've tried to forgive. How many of you have tried to forgive and you just couldn't, <laughs> right? You've tried, you've tried, you've, I'm going to love them, I'm going to love them. I don't love them. We've all been there, and we come to the end of ourselves, brothers and sisters, until we come to the end of ourselves and the end of our resources, we will not be humbled. We will not. As long as I've got something I can depend on, I'm not humbled under God's hand. As long as I can make it happen, I'm not humbled under God's hand. As long as I can do something and make it happen and do it and, and provide and this and that, look beyond just the physical. As long as I can do it, I'm not humbled. I'm depending on me. I can do it. I can do it.
And God in love allows us to come to the edge of ourselves, to the end of ourselves, if you will. I have no resources left. I have no grace left for this person. Have you ever been to that place? No grace left? None. No grace. And you feel like the worst Christian, don't you? No grace. No love. No whatever. I know I should forgive. I don't want to forgive. They haven't even said sorry. They don't even see how they've wronged me. And resentment and anger builds up in my heart. And I've come to the end of myself. Does that make sense? We come to the end of ourselves. And when we realize, oh God, we've come to the end of ourselves. God, oh God, that's when we're humbled. That's when we say, oh God, I thought I could. And I can't. I can't. And at that point, God gives you his manna. He gives you his manna. He gives you the grace that you need to forgive. He gives you the soft heart when you had such a hard heart towards that person. He gives you the insight to see, Lord, I thought it was them, and God, it's me too. I'm doing it too. Lord, I, I'm part of this problem. I thought it was that person, that person, that person. Oh, God, this is my part in it. Does that make sense to us this morning? God brings us to the end of ourselves. And until we come to the end of ourselves, there's no humbling and there's no helping. There's no helping. God can't help us until we come to that. And so God in love humbles us so that he can help us. And this, this is what we see. This is what we see. He still works this way with people. He still works this way. Look at Deuteronomy 8, 16, and uh, actually verse 16. That was the next one. He says, He fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers had not known. It's the, brothers and sisters, that's the way God does it. It's some, two times in chapter 8, He says, They fed you with, with manna that your fathers hadn't known. That's in Deuteronomy 8, 16. And that you had not known. That's the way God does it. God's resource comes to you unexpectedly. God's resource comes to you when you didn't know where it was going to come from. I gave the example in the first service. This is a physical example, but God does this spiritually as well. And it's such a good example. I want to remind you of this again. Years ago, do you remember the, the testimony that Big Steve, he's in the Philippines, I think, already this morning, um, that Big Steve gave when he was a brand new Christian? Here's this big, tough guy. You know, Steve can... He can do anything, right? This big, tough guy, brand new Christian. And, and most of you know that Steve uh, is diabetic. And um, early in his Christian life, Steve, I guess it was between jobs or something like that, Steve came to the point where he had no food in his house, in his home, nothing in the cabinet except sugar. That's it. Hey, great, <laughs> you're diabetic. And he said, you remember the testimony? He, he said, I knew, so it was one day he knew that the next morning he would have to start eating sugar. That's all, that's all there was. And God spoke to somebody. I was so blessed when he gave that testimony. God spoke to someone and someone just handed him money at that time. They didn't know his need. They didn't know, they didn't know anything. But God knew. I imagine for Steve it was probably humbling. Here's this big guy. He can do anything, right? I mean, he helped build the bridge to the airport. <laughs> you know he did. He was one of those hanging upside down, building the bridge. He helped mend shark nets in the waters of Hong Kong. And, and he'd been a bank manager when he was in the UK. I mean, all of this. And all he had was sugar in the cabinet. That's it. That's it. But God brought him to the end of himself that he might bless him. And that's what God does. That's a physical example. But brothers and sisters, God does that spiritually as well. And I think it's important as we look at verse 16 to look at the last verse. We talked about this. We closed with this very quickly last time. He did all of this. Look at the last part of that verse so that in the end he might cause you to what? Prosper. prosper. Some of your Bible translations will say so that he might do good to you in the end. I think that's what a lot of the translations say. And that, encur that should encourage us as well. Because a lot of times, for you and for me, 
we come to the place of humbling and testing and hard times. And if we're not careful, we come not to the point of humbling, but to the point of bitterness with God and blaming God, you could and you haven't. Why haven't you done this? You could whatever. And instead of seeing that God is a good God, as we sang this morning, you are good, good, so good. Instead, we just stay with the hardness. This is so hard. God, you haven't done something. You haven't changed. You haven't helped. And you could. And you haven't. And we blame God. I, I remember one of the first Bible studies I taught here in Hong Kong. It was not in Lighthouse. It was outside of Lighthouse. Irene may have been there. I don't remember. It may have been. I, I'm, I'm not, it wasn't Irene. <laughs> it wasn't Irene. But I remember um, I was with a, a group of ladies and I said something about God is good, isn't he? Has God ever failed you? And one of the ladies in the group looked at me and she said, yes. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I, uh, because of a situation in in her family and so she was at the all she could see was this is hard and she couldn't see beyond and brothers and sisters what you and I have to hold on to what you and I have to hold, hold on to is this God works to bring us to this point that he might cause you to prosper that he might cause me to prosper but he's not going to prosper pride He's not going to bless independence and self-reliance. And so he pushes and he presses that that in us might be dealt with and might be broken in order that he might bless, because he wants to bless. Don't think that God is sitting up in heaven reluctant to pour out grace on you or me. Oh, God is a God. Hey, God is the God who made Adam and Eve and then put them in the Garden of Eden, this beautiful garden that had shemadoyo, as we say, had everything, had everything. God is a God who delights to bless his children. He loves you, but he wants to bring us to the place where he can bless us, where he can prosper us, and so he deals with us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so, we understand, we have to understand how God worked with them to understand how he works with us. Now, very quickly, let's go through a long passage of Deuteronomy 8. I, I promise I'm not going to read it all, but just take a look as you see how God's working. This is still the words of Moses, okay? Look at, uh, you say, oh, you're going to read all that? Promise, I'm not going to read all that. Moses is, is preparing them to go into the land of blessing, right? They've been wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. And then he says, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. You see, God couldn't bring them into a good land until he had dealt with them in humbling in the wilderness, until they had learned that God was their source, until they had learned that God was their blessing, until they had learned that God was the one who provided for them. That's why he put them in the wilderness. That's why he allowed them in the wilderness. There's no food there. There's no water there. Where am I going to get food? Where am I going to get water? Only from the hand of God. Only from the hand of God. And that's what God wants us to see as well. And so Moses says, You're gonna, God's going to take you into a good land. Look at it. It's a wonderful land. Um, streams of water and springs. Well, that's nice. And deep water sources. That's even nicer. Those of you that have ever lived in a place where there are deep water sources. Where I live in the U.S., uh, at my home back in the U.S. where mom and dad are now, we have a deep water source. There's a lake in front of the house, and there's some streams, but those are not deep water sources. But right on the edge, several places on the land that mom and dad have, there are some deep water sources. We don't have to have a pump. We don't have to have an engine. They've dug down deep. There's a pipe down there, and beautiful, cold, clean water just bubbles out. It's so clean, there's no chlorine in it, there are no additives, doesn't have to go through a filter. And some of you are going, wah, that's right. <laughs> it, it's wonderful water, it really is. That's what God was bringing them into. And that's, that's a picture for us, right? That's a picture for us. Um, and he says, this is the type of land that God is bringing you into, a land where you will eat food without shortage. Then look at verse 10. When you eat and you're full, you will praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Who gives it? 
God gives it. Okay, look at the next, uh, the next verses that come after, after that. And then Moses says, look with me, verse 11, be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his command. Ah, ding, 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 ding. The brain, the brain bell should be going right now. Because remember, we've been talking about what, is God, what does James say? Submit yourselves to the Lord. Humble yourself. What does submit mean? Four-letter word. Obey. 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 And Moses says, don't forget to keep on obeying. When you eat and are full and build beautiful houses to live in, all of these things, you increase. Be careful that your heart doesn't become proud. proud. That your heart doesn't become proud. I have seen Christians that spiritually have prospered through the hardest of times. And when things got easier and blessings came, they left the Lord behind. They left the Lord behind. And Moses says, never forget, never forget, it's God who prospers. It's God who blesses. Be careful that your heart doesn't become proud. He led you through that terrible wilderness. He fed you. And then look at the next slide. You may say to yourself, my power, my own ability have gained this wealth for me. May I say to you, if you and I ever come to the place as children of God where we say, look what I've accomplished. Look what I've done. Look what I have made to work. We're in danger. We're in danger. Are we gifted people? Yes, we're gifted people. Are we talented people? Yes, we're talented people. Do we work hard? Sure, we work hard. Do we study hard? Yes, we study hard. All of these things. I, I think Christians in a, in, a, in a school, in a country, in a city, in a job, we should be the hardest workers. We should be the best students. All of these things. It's, it's an honor to the Lord. But it's God who equips us and empowers us to do that. That's what Moses is saying. That's what Moses is saying. And so God says to them and he says to us, learn these lessons in the time of humbling, that I might bless you in other times. I was thinking about this, uh, and I, I thought about, I was thinking about myself when I first went to China, before many of you were even born, way back when, 1986, when I first went to China. I went to northern China, and then I went to uh, Peking University, where, where Ben is now, and I was teaching in the English department there. I was a Christian, I was a spirit-filled Christian, and I loved God, and I sacrificed to go to China. I gave up my university job. I gave up my sports car that I loved with all of my heart. <laughs> I really, and you say, oh, you're so carnal. I'm sorry, I loved my sports car. It was silver, <laughs> so. All of these things, and you say, well, you're boasting now. I'm not. What I want you to understand is this. I loved God. I wasn't out living a sinful life. And I went to China because God had opened the door and I believed he was calling me there. I was going to save China. <laughs> I was. I was going to tell everybody about Jesus. I was going to all, lead all of my students to the Lord. And in my first two years in China, I was, I was telling the first, first service and I can't remember if it was, I either was able to tell no one about Jesus or one person. One. One in two years. I felt like such a failure. And it wasn't because I hadn't prayed. It wasn't because I hadn't fasted. I, my heart was so full. I was, oh, I was fasting and praying. I was getting up early before I went to China because I was going to do this for God. But God humbled me through two years of, I, I cannot tell you how hard it was when I would cry on my bed and I thought, God, I cannot take this. God, I cannot make it. God, what is the purpose and the point? And the pressure didn't let up. And the pressure kept on coming. Why? Because God saw something that I didn't see in myself. My pride. My self-reliance. My independence. My leaning on the things that I could do. I'm a good teacher. I'm a good speaker. I'm this and I'm that. And I didn't see that these were things that I was really depending on, even as I prayed and even as I called out to the Lord. But the Lord saw what I didn't see. 
And so he humbled, he humbled, he humbled that he might prosper me, that he might do something that's good. And I'm sharing that with you, brothers and sisters, and honestly, I want you to think well of me, but in a way, I don't really care. That's just the honest, that's the truth of it. But I share that with you so that we all understand there are things about ourselves we just don't know. There are things about ourselves that we just don't see. I, I, I think, honestly, I probably pride is one of the worst things because we just don't see pride, do we? I think we just don't, it's one of the things we just don't see. But God does. But God does, and he wants to bless us because he wants to prosper us. And so we come to the Lord and we submit ourselves. And if we're going through a hard time, and we're going through a pressing time, as I said last time, I believe it is absolutely right and absolutely scriptural just to go back to God again and say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but Lord, if you're doing something, do it. Do it. Lord, if I'm not humbling myself to you, show me. Show me where I can and how I can. Because each one of us have different areas. It's easy for me to look at you and say, well, you're proud in this area. It's easy for you to look at me and say, well, you're proud in this area. And it's so easy to look at others. But God looks at us. God looks at us. And we come back. Um, let's go to slide nine. We come back again to our, as we come near to the conclusion this morning, the last seven or eight minutes or so, we come back to our two, to our two um, theme passages. So Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You know, I used to read this, and I'd come to verse 7, and I always kind of thought, why is verse 7 in there? Look at it. Verse 7 doesn't seem to fit so well. He's talking about humbling yourself and the devil and resisting him. And then right here in verse 7 he says, Cast all your cares on him for he cares, on, cares for you. Why does he say that there? Did Peter kind of get the wrong idea and just kind of wrote something there that, should, that doesn't really belong there? I think it fits there. I think it belongs there. Do you know why it's there? Because when you and I come to the place where we are considering, I'm going to humble myself, we come to the place where we say, okay, God, I'm going to submit. When we come to the place where we say, okay, I'm going to obey. I can't really tithe. I don't think I have enough money to tithe, but Lord, I'm going to trust you with my finances, so here we go. I'm going to obey. Or in whatever area, you and I get anxious, don't we? How many of you start worrying, I won't have enough money? How many of you say, but if I humble myself, they're going to take advantage of me? And if I say, I'm sorry, please forgive me for my wrong, they're going to go, heh, yeah, well, you should. Remember, I've given you the example one time when I was about 13 or 14 years old when I was such a good Christian and my sister and I had had a big fight and I thought, I'll be the better Christian. Some of you remember this. And I looked at her. I was so proud. I was so proud. And I said, well, I'm sorry. And you know what my sister said? You should be. <laughs> I am not making this up. I was, and then my response tells you what was really in my heart. I was so angry. I stopped the car. You say you were driving at 13? Yeah, it was on the farm. You know, I wasn't on the high. It was on a dirt road. I stopped the car. I slammed the door shut. <laughs> and I stomped all the way home. I was so angry. Because what she was supposed to say was, I'm sorry too. No, she was supposed to say, I'm sorry too, because she was, Sister Bridget, she was more wrong than I was. <laughs> that tells you my wicked heart, doesn't it? That tells you our wicked hearts, doesn't it? Our, our motives are so, so mixed. That, that, see? That showed you, not what was in my, well, it showed my sister's heart, but it really showed my heart, didn't it? It, it, show, it showed my heart. And I, we laughed about that, and I can laugh now, but I can tell you I wasn't laughing at the time. But now, before you laugh at me, you think about yourself. <laughs> we don't want to humble ourselves, because Peter says, humble, your, humble yourselves to one another, submit to one another. We don't want to do that because we're afraid we'll get taken advantage of, right? 
We don't want to humble ourselves because we're afraid somebody go, hmm, and push us down. We're scared to, we're frightened to obey because we're afraid it's going to be too hard. We're, to use the example again, perhaps of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, tithing, for example, I, I can't, I can't tithe because if I tithe, if I, tithe, if I give 10% to God, I'm not going to have enough to pay my bills. And we're anxious about it. May I say to you that I believe our anxiety is a sign. Please don't take this the wrong way, but I believe it's a sign and it's a symptom of pride. I really do. Because what it means is I'm count I have to count on myself, right? I have to take care of me. I got to make sure the world treats me right. I got to make sure that I'm top of the heap. I've got to make sure that I receive the respect that I'm supposed to receive. And so we fight for ourselves and we push and we all of these things. And what God is saying to you and to me in all of this is this. If you will submit and humble yourself to me, and if you will trust me, all those things you're anxious about, take them, throw them on me. That's what it means. Throw them on me. Why? I'm going to take care of you. That's what it means to humble ourselves. When we humble ourselves, we put ourselves in God's care. He's going to take care of us. He is. He's going to handle it. That's, that's what it means. And he says we can cast it on him because he cares for us. And because then, at the right time, at the right time, what does it say? He will lift us up in due time. What does due time mean? At just the right time. At just the right time. And what does it say? He will lift you up. The devil will be defeated. And as we come to a conclusion this morning, brothers and sisters, are we anxious about these things? Sure we are. Sure we are. Sure we are. But God says, I will take care of you. God says, I will lift you up at the right time. And if God has not yet lifted you up and you've been going through a hard time, it may not be the right time. It may be that we are not yet humbled. It may be that we're still resisting, even though we kind of think, yes, God, help me, help me. But there's still that, uh, there's still that pride in us, the self-reliance. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to do it. And so God keeps pressing. Or it may be God has just not finished his work yet in us. Because if he's working on our character, it's going to take a while, right? It's going to take a while. It's not an easy thing to make us like Jesus, as I have found in my own life. As I have found in my own life and as you're finding in yours. But Jesus says to you and to me, if you will, I'm going to give you grace. That's why it says he is the... God of all grace. Give me the last slide. There's just a little bit more. Okay. It says, and the God of all grace. I love that. The God of all grace. You're going to need grace to make it through. And I am too. You're going to need grace to forgive somebody who has not said, I'm wrong. It takes grace. But the God of all grace will give it to you if you'll humble yourself. The devil will flee. Oh, I'm so glad that Peter was the one who wrote this because he wrote from experience, didn't he? Peter was the one who said, Oh, Lord. Oh, it sounds just like us. Though all the others, they will abandon you. I will follow you to what? Death. Prison and death. But all the others. Oh, did Peter have gifts and talents? You bet. He did. He did just as we do. Jesus recognized that in Peter. That's why Jesus called. That's one of the reasons Jesus called Peter. That was one of the reasons Jesus spent more time with Peter. But there were other things in Peter as well. Oh, Lord, all these others. Huh? You think John's so great, but Lord, he's going he's gonna to abandon you. Who was the one to fail and fall the worst? Peter was. And that's why Peter can say, oh, humble yourselves under the Lord and he'll lift you up. And I close with this. I, have you failed and fallen short at times in your walk with God? And you just feel like, God, I'm a jerk. I'm such a terrible Christian. And you feel like, how can...
Jesus had enough grace for Peter. He had enough grace for Peter. And I want to tell you, as we, close, as we end now, if Jesus said, Peter, I've prayed for you, you're going to be restored. Remember how that closes? Remember how that closes? After you've suffered a little while, he will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. What did Jesus do for Peter on the morning that he was raised from the dead? Jesus appeared to Peter personally, personally, and restored him. Peter is the one who writes this. There's enough grace. There's enough grace. There's enough grace in God under his mighty hand. Let's close. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you. I know about me. I need grace. <laughs> Lord, we come to you right now. And Father, I pray for this church what I have prayed for myself and continue to pray for myself. May we choose to humble ourselves under your mighty hand. May we choose to submit and obey and receive all the grace that you have for us. Lord, I cast my cares. I throw them onto you. I'm worried about this, but what if I throw them to you because you care for me? Would you lift us up at the right time, in due time, not too soon, not too late, at the right time, and restore. May we live in grace and victory. May the enemy flee this year, in this year of grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God.